Welcome, everyone, to The Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. My guest today is Karen L. Cox, a historian and author who specializes in the American South. She's here today to talk about her book, Goat Castle, A True Story of Murder, Race, and the Gothic South. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to be with you. This is quite a story and, and not one that I'm guessing most of my listeners know about. Where did you come across this murder and how did you come to write a book about it? Um, I was in the working in the state archives in Mississippi doing research on a topic related to Natchez, Mississippi. And I was trying to understand what drew people to the town in 1932. And I you know, one of the things that did draw people to the town was their pilgrimage of homes. They're, they have a great grouping of antebellum mansions there in Natchez. Um, but it was while I was working on that that the uh, historian who'd been working there forever, and he told me, he said, you need to look at Goat Castle. And he said, Goat Castle put Natchez on the map. And how could I resist <laughs> the two <laughs> words, Goat Castle, together? Um, and so I, I did a little research that day, years before I, you know, before I started the book. And I just knew instinctively that it was a, a story that I wanted to pursue. And what I had assumed about the story and what many generations of people had assumed about it turned out to be far different from the, the book I wrote. So your book is set in the segregated South and racism provides a predominant backdrop to your story. Can you talk a little bit about the city of Natchez and the state of Mississippi during this time? Right. Well, I mean, Mississippi, you know, earned its reputation on race for for good reason. In the decades after the Civil War, it was just a very violent place um, where race is concerned because African-Americans – the you know the freedmen uh, of those former plantations um the the white community was just not prepared for that nor were, were they willing to succumb to the the law of the land the, the reconstruction laws that was providing them with citizenship so they tried to break bring people back in line uh to respect the racial status quo and through violence if necessary when we fast forward up to the time of this murder that I wrote about uh, in the 20s and, and early 30s, uh, Jim Crow is, is firmly in place. And, and that means that if you're a, an African-American, you have to abide by the status quo, the racial status quo in that state. For those who didn't want to really or were seeking a better life, many of them had uh, become part of the great migration out of the South to northern cities. And yet just as many stayed behind. And so in 1932, Natchez was about 55 percent black, but most of them were still engaged in agriculture in the surrounding areas as sharecroppers. Or they were, uh, if they lived in the city of Natchez, then they, like, um, they were, uh, the women were primarily going to be domestics, either doing laundry or cleaning homes or cooking for white families. Men would be laborers either in agriculture or they even had some businesses there in Natchez. And so, uh, they might have been able to do that. Or in, if they were fortunate enough, they were engaged in, uh, their own businesses. Um, there was a black business district in Natchez that included bars and grocery stores and funeral homes. And Natchez, and specifically Natchez under the hill, has, has quite a storied reputation throughout history, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, Natchez under the hill. So there's, there's the Natchez proper, which sits on the bluffs of the Mississippi River, overlooking the river and into Louisiana. And then then there's the Natchez under the hill, which historically had a reputation, you know, as a place where, you know, ships would dock and and there were brothels and there were knife fights and there was a lot of crime and really sort of the, you know, kind of the rogue characters of the of the old South could be found there. And and so there was this sort of unruly set of people that that spent their time down below the bluffs, but above the bluffs was the place where, you know, people of of a better class uh, lived and worked. 
You have quite a number of fascinating characters in this book. I'd like to start with the victim, uh, Jenny Merrill, and her longtime alleged love interest, Duncan Miner. Can you talk a bit about their their family histories, history together, and, and what brought them together as neighbors in Natchez? Sure. Jenny Merrill was the victim here. She was murdered in her home during a botched robbery. But Jenny Merrill was, uh, and and her cousin Duncan Miner, who pretty much had dedicated himself to her his whole life. Uh, whether or not they ever married, we'll never know. But both the Merrills and the Miners were descended from the just the the uber elite, the one percent of planters in the South. They were extremely wealthy. Their families had been extremely wealthy. Jenny Merrill's grandfather was probably one of the wealthiest planters in the entire South before the Civil War. He owned plantations in three states and around 1,000 slaves. Uh, her father owned around 600 slaves. Uh, this is ex- just extreme wealth. Her father, Ayers Merrill, from the family Merrills were from Massachusetts originally. And uh, in the years after the war, her father, uh, th- this is the other thing, but because of those northern planters, uh, many of them were actually unionists, even though they owned slaves. So her father was one of those. And in the years after the war, he went back to the north uh, and uh, would be for his loyalty to the union was given a position as the ambassador to Belgium. Duncan Miner's family had been dis- it was descended from you know the Spanish the period of Spanish rule in Natchez so his family had been there even longer than the Merrills and was also from uh, a extremely wealthy family. Duncan Miner and Jenny Merrill were they were second cousins so it would not have been like in the antebellum period you know uh, among plantation families it would not have been unusual for her to have married a second cousin. But in the in the in the post-war period, she even though she would have been expect you know before she would have gone become a belle and she would have expected to marry to keep the money in the family and all of that. She in the post-war period, um, her mother is you know dies in childbirth when she's a a baby, and her father dies in 1879. So she's a young woman of like 20 years of age and. Has, has a, an inheritance and she wants to live and go do things. And that's what she does. And, you know, and then she finally returns to Natchez and lives out the rest of her life. And Duncan Miner has been waiting on her the whole time. And he's almost a pathetic character, honestly, <laughs> that he's waiting to say, you know, saved himself. And, and um, it's not really clear, you know, what their relationship is like, except, On from his point of view, which he writes her dozens and dozens of notes that exist about his and his love for her. And we don't see anything in return from her, although I get the sense that she's she finds him annoying. At the same time, she she has no one else. And so uh, he comes and spends the you know evenings with her. um, And he usually arrives just like clockwork between 830 and nine in the evening. And it's 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 um, right before that in August of 1932 that she's killed in a botched robbery. And um, and he when he shows up at the the time, he usually does local blacks who are likely who likely worked for Jenny Merrill um, have told him that they've heard shots coming out of her house. Gunshots. Let's shift to their neighbors, the squatters at the Glenwood estate Dick Dana and Octavia Dockery. How, how did they come to meet and live together? That took some digging for me to discover that. Glenwood, which is the adjacent estate to Jenny Merrill's, was the home of Dick Dana's father, uh, who was an Episcopal rector. And it had once been a nice home. Dick Dana was born there on the estate. But by 1932, the estate had fallen into rack and ruin, and and he had kind of declined mentally. And Octavia Dockery was who was not his girlfriend, wife, or anything. She just became uh, his guardian because of his mental state. They moved in there around 1912, is my guess. 
and then moved out for a while and then back on the estate by 1916. While this estate was Dick Dana's inheritance, he he was not in a position, he was not capable of maintaining it or paying taxes on it. So for many years, the, the property was sold for taxes, but nothing was ever done with it. And Dick Dana and Octavia Dockery were just essentially squatters from 1916 until the late 40s. He dies in 1948. She'll die in 19, early 1949. They never left the estate. But as early as 1917, court documents described Glenwood as dilapidated. Um, it had no electricity, no running water. The chimneys were crumbling in. The roof was leaking. Uh, it was, as it would be described in the media later, the embodiment of the fall of the House of Usher. <laughs> it was it was this place that had just become decrepit and the people inside it had also kind of crumbled in, you know, mentally. So they they move in next door to Jenny Merrill around 1916 and in their squatters and Octavia sort of tries to make a living uh, raising chickens and they have other animal goats and hogs and that becomes the you know the basis of this feud between these two women Jenny Merrill and Octavia Dockery over whether it's trespassing hogs or trespassing goats they're just feud from day 1 so Jenny Merrill and Octavia Dockery begin a very heated feud as you've mentioned and Jenny Merrill is no wallflower in all of this either i mean she could dish just as well as she could take how did this feud originate and, and how did it escalate? Right. There is this, there's a constant feuding between these two women. And in, and I do believe it's a lot, has a lot to do with, with class. And, um, Jenny Merrill, you know, descended from the, the elite, the most elite of the planner class. Octavia Dockery is originally from Arkansas and, was born into a planter family, but they had lost everything by the end of the war. So she is, is, so while Jenny's still doing well and has money in the bank, um, Octavia Dockery is a woman who has lost everything and, um, is having to, you know, as she would say, scratch out a living on, on this estate next door. So there, there's this bitterness between them. Over, I believe over issues of class, you know, one, you know, Octavia thinking Merrill thinks she's better than her and Merrill probably does believe she's better than Octavia Dockery. So there's this tension between these two women and the fact that they can't, they, that Oct Dana and Dockery can't maintain the state and their, and their livestock does trample over to Merrill's estate and does damage. And so, over the years, the sheriff's office would be called out repeatedly to one or the other's home to try to settle disputes between the two of them. And it was the week before Merrill's death that apparently they got into a, a, a vicious argument, uh, according to the press, over the trespassing goats. So we have a, a third duo in this story, Emily Burns and Lawrence Williams. Can you explain how their relationship began and developed? Sure. Lawrence Williams um, was born in Adams County in the 1870s. Um, by World War I, he had joined many other people from Adams County in the Great Migration, and he had landed in Chicago. But he he went by aliases, so he, gave, he in Chicago he was known as George Pearls and he had a wife and he worked at the Argo factory where, you know, make cornstarch and, but it was the depression and he had returned to Natchez where he knew people. He had family there and he had worked for local planners and that's where he met Emily Burns. And Emily is one of these African American. She's part of an African American family that didn't migrate, that they stayed in Natchez and, in the summer of 1932, when Lawrence, he, he introduces himself as Lawrence Williams or Pinckney Williams, again, another alias uh, to her that summer. And and um, she and her mother, both widows, they run a, a, a boarding house. They allow people just to rent rooms from where they live. And, you know, Lawrence Williams, Pinckney Williams came to town that summer 
1932 in late July, and he rented a room from Emily and her mother. And so I I get the sense that the two of them sort of had a something of a relationship. And uh, and so uh, they will ultimately be the two people implicated and assumed to be uh, guilty of the crime of, of murdering Jenny Merrill. Now that we've introduced all the major characters, um, a pivotal moment in this story takes place when Lawrence Williams goes looking for work. He knocks on the doors of Merrill and then Duncan Minor. When he can't find work there, he goes next door where he fatefully meets Octavia Dockery. Right. Yeah. So when Williams returns, he's been in Chicago for two decades. And and so he's returning to where he he's worked for Duncan Minor as a young man. Um, and I think he goes to both his days. He goes to he goes to Jenny Merrill and she refuses him to, to hire him, but apparently gives him something to eat. He, you know, he tries with Duncan Minor. Duncan Minor also, you know, refuses to hire him and refers to him as insolent. And what that means is essentially that Southern blacks who had moved to the north but had returned south had clearly, you know, in their mind and in the minds of whites had forgotten what the Southern way of life was, which was you, you know, you act deferential to all whites. And apparently he didn't do that. And which is why Duncan Minor, you know, referred to him in that way. So, um, yeah, so he tries to get work there. Nothing comes of it. Then he, you know, walks across to the next estate and, to Glenwood where Dick Dane and Octavia Dockery are. And it's clear from the, the, um, <laughs> the estate that there's no work to be had. He can tell that they don't have any money. Um, but it, it is there in Williams meeting Dick Dane and Octavia Dockery. But I think primarily Octavia Dockery that there is a plot to rob Jenny Merrill. Can you walk us through that evening when Williams goes back to the boarding house and asks Emily Burns to take an evening walk with him. She complies um, as she's kind of sweet on him, as you suggest in the book, but she suddenly pulled into something far darker than I'm sure she ever expected. Yes. So she goes on a walk with him very willingly. And eventually it, they, he leads her toward Jenny Merrill's house and the estate next door, which is, Glenwood. And along the way, he says, he tells her that he plans to get money from Merrill. And so she realizes what's about to take place and wants to leave, but he threatens to kill her. Um, and he has a gun. And so he threatens to kill her. So she's, she's sort of already caught up in this. And so they head over, eventually they head over to Glenwood where they meet up with Dana and Dockery. And the four of them will end up on Jenny Merrill's estate uh, and hide out beneath the porch of the house of Merrill's porch and try to get a bead on where she might be. And 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 uh, and so that's when, you know, Williams decides to go into the house and uh, to rob Merrill. And clearly Jenny Merrill is as you said, is no wallflower. So she, and she has guns and it, it appears that there was a struggle in the house. According to uh, later, Emily will give a confession in which she describes hearing a scuffle in the house. Uh, and then there were shots fired. And it seems that Jenny Merrill probably tried to put up a fight with Williams and uh, ends up losing her life as a result. At that time, then, no, here is Jenny Merrill shot and blood is pouring out onto the floor. And he and it's it's unclear. It could be have been Dick Dana. It could have been another friend of theirs named Ed Newell, who was who is said to have joined them, carry Jenny Merrill's body outside of the house and, and take it about 100 yards from the home and throw it into a thicket. And then they head back into the home and ransack it 
looking for money. They, you know, and, and meanwhile, Octavia Dockery and Dick Daner are also inside the house doing their own bit of ransacking. Um, Emily is told to stay outside and hold a, you know, with a lamp and says, you know, basically you stand watch while we look for money and nothing is found because Jenny Merrill didn't keep money in the house. And uh, unlike people think, you know, about the depression, everyone kept their money under a mattress. She didn't do that. And so they basically came up empty handed, but now a woman had been murdered. And so the, they all scatter to their different homes. Dana and Dockery scurry back over to Glenwood and Williams and uh, Emily Burns head back to her home. And he basically, Williams takes his clothes off, burns them, and he is um, given a ride to get out of town. And he's, his goal was to head back north, but he leaves behind his belongings with Emily Burns. And now, you know, it's just a matter of, of an investigation. Duncan Miner comes back, comes to visit as he normally would that evening. And local blacks who lived on the estate or nearby estates told him about hearing gunshots. He goes to the house and, and calls out for her and can't find her. Uh, and eventually they call the sheriff's office about an hour after he arrived, um, that they can't, there's blood everywhere and they can't find Jenny Merrill. She was shot twice, right? Yes. I think she was, people heard about three shots. She was shot in the chest and she was shot through the neck, probably through her jugular vein. Um, I've I've seen the actual autopsy report or the, or her death certificate. I'm, I'm sorry that that explained exactly where she was shot. So it went through her, jugular vein and then also through her chest uh the the first one might not have killed her but the you know the one through the neck did and which caused all the blood that was there and 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 then blood out all over the porch and down the steps and out through the woods but this was dark it was a new moon so there was no moonlight there was it was completely pitch black so they don't find her body until the wee hours of the following morning um which was august 5th and Duncan Miner was was left heir to her estate, correct? Yes, he was the single person that she gave left everything to. Can you talk a little bit about Sheriff Book Roberts, who he was, and how he becomes involved in this case? Sheriff Roberts, his name's Clarence Roberts. He goes by Book, his nickname, and he he's been with the sheriff's office since 1925, and then been you know, as a deputy and now he's, you know, he's full-time sheriff and he's very familiar with the feuding between Jenny Merrill and Octavia Dockery and that just the the two of them and the, you know, because he's had to send out deputies regularly uh, since he's held office. And so when he gets the call at the sheriff's office that Jenny Merrill's gone missing and there's blood and everything, he, he heads over to the estate to, you know, began the investigation. There's a lot of people come out. He hired, he, you know, he deputizes additional people because Merrill is a prominent citizen of the area and from, you know, such an important family in Natchez. So a lot of uh, men are, are deputized and, and they go out to the, her estate to see what's going on. And he, he knows he's got to go talk to the neighbors next door. So he, leaves, you know, the people to, you know, his deputies to continue to do the search and heads over next door. And it's by this time, it's close to midnight. He's headed next door to Glenwood to talk to Dana and Dockery because he believes that, you know, he's already suspicious because of the the feuding between them. And, And particularly during that week leading up to her murder, that there had been a vicious fight between them. So he goes there with a deputy and he, you know, knocks on the door and it's pitch black at this point. Um, they, I assume that, you know, they have flashlights and they're looking and they see a blood, fresh blood on a, uh, a magazine in the front parlor and they call out for, you know, Dick Dana to come downstairs and talk to them and he refuses and then eventually he comes down. You have to understand, I mean, you know, he's been declared non compass mentis, which means he's 
you know, he's liable to say anything and he does. And so as he comes down the stairs before the sheriff has asked the first question, Dick Dana blurts out, I know nothing of the murder. (laughs) So he's, he's immediately arrested and whatever Octavia Dockery says to the sheriff that evening causes him to find, you know, be suspicious of her. And so she's also arrested and they take them into the Adams County jail for questioning. And they will be the bane of his existence (laughs) for probably the next year and a half as he tries to investigate this case. So Sheriff Roberts is hot on their trail and knows that they're involved. And Dana basically blurts out information he shouldn't have known, that, that a murder had happened. But, but then things begin to shift. Lawrence Williams' role is soon identified, and police start focusing on him instead of Dockery and Dana. So what happens, they, okay, so they're arrested, but they get charged with murder because there is fingerprint evidence. Their fingerprints are found inside Jenny Merrill's house. So they're there for a good reason. But what ends up happening is they bring, you know, a Maurice O'Neill in there, the, the detective from New Orleans, who sorts, begins to assist in the investigation and it leads them into the black community, which is not uncommon in the Jim Crow South. There's always the assumption that there must be a guilty Negro in the parlance of the time. So they begin investigating into the, the, in the black community looking for this guy named Williams and they, you know, they're, they're doing that. Meanwhile, Lawrence Williams, who's headed back to Chicago to see his wife three days after Jenny Merrill's murdered is him, himself murdered, uh, shot and killed by a police deputy in Pine Bluff, Arkansas under completely different circumstances. Uh, allegedly resisting arrest, shot and killed on the streets there. And in his belongings were papers that uh, referred to him as George Pearls, which was his name in Chicago. And they, they think the, you know, the police chief thinks this is the guy from Natchez because there were Natchez belongings, references in his belongings. And so they called the sheriff to say so. And he said, you know, and sheriff, Roberts is like, no, we're not looking for anybody named George Pearls. So what ends up happening is some local blacks who, you know, the sheriff relies on to tell him what's going on. They say, oh, there was a man by this description, by the name Williams, who was staying uh, in the home of Emily Burns and her mother. And say so they go and knock on the door and lo and behold, there are his his trunk of belongings that he left behind inside of that trunk were papers referring to a man named George Pearls. And so they, they put two and two together and they arrest Emily. They arrest her mother and, and take them down to the County jail where they begin their interrogation of her and, and her, I think her mother's held as a material witness to try to get as much information out of her as well. And so by the time she comes into the jail, you know, there's a sympathy building up for Dana and Dockery and the story of their sad existence out at, at Glenwood, living in, you know, in a falling down house, goats living in a pen inside of the house, you know, just, you know, just living in, in a derelict situation. So they so they get released on their own recognizance to return to to back to their estate and it then the the investigation and the focus shifts entirely on Emily and whatever she knows about this guy Lawrence Williams. So while Dockery and Dana are being held in in jail tourists begin descending on their dilapidated house. They steal some of their property for souvenirs. There's no one there to protect the estate. And this this situation begins to create some sympathy for Dockery and Dana while, while they're being held. Right. Well, the two of them give jailhouse interviews, and that creates some of the sympathy of their of, for them and their lives at at their you know dilapidated estate. And that is a story. They're they're photographed in jail, and there's a that story. 
as they told, uh, you know, their, their life stories, that the photograph of them together plus their stories circulated nationally. And then all, and then the press started referring to their home as goat castle because they lived with their goats inside the house. And then it became, and then, and it became all about them. It became about this story of, of the decline of Southern aristocracy, Dick Dana's mental decline. So he's gets a nickname as the wild man, Octavia Dockery's fall from grace as a Southern belle. Now she's tending to goats and hogs and she's referred to as the goat woman. And all this is about, the story becomes about them. And as they're in jail, yes, people have read this story and they know there are antiques in that house. And they come to Natchez the weekend after their arrest. And they said something like, I'm like one Sunday afternoon, nearly a thousand visitors come, you know, trespass onto the estate and take things from it and begin, you know, 40, 50 miles away or putting it on exhibit. I mean, it just, it just becomes this, you know, crazy frenzy and media frenzy uh, as well around these, this pair. And, and so this sort of voyeuristic tourist trade will, you know, become part of their existence for the next couple of months. Once they get out of jail, the two of them go home and realize, you know, that people have an interest in seeing not only the estate, but uh, the house itself. Um, they prepare it and they begin um, charging admission. And so over while they're still charged with murder during the months of September and October, they basically collect receipts <laughs> for um, tours of their estate and their home. Uh, so they completely capitalize on their notoriety. And in the meantime, the focus continues to shift more towards Emily Burns. And she confesses, but she does so under the implied threat of physical violence, right? Yes, she does. She's she's a special deputy named John Junk. And by the way, he, he was he eventually was in the Mississippi legislature and there's a name there in the road that goes in front of Merrill's estate, which still exists. Goat Castle does not is named John Junkin Drive, which I think is a real irony because John Junkin was a was deputized and he's the one who forced the confession of Emily Burns by laying a bullwhip on the table in front of her and told her she had 30 minutes to confess. And the implication was, if you don't, you're going to get a whipping with this bullwhip. Emily was a participant in this, a forced participant, but but she really is a, a victim too. She she certainly is. She was victimized by Lawrence Williams because he brought her along with knowing that he intended to rob Jenny Merrill, and then threatened her life if she said anything. Then she you know, learns that he's been killed in Pine Bluff. And now she knows she's the only other person who really knows other than Dick Dane and Octavia Dockery, who she implicates repeatedly, but it's the Jim Crow South and they're not going to, they're not going to convict the white people. Uh, they're going to convict a black person and she's, she ends up being the one and she doesn't have a chance. Her civil rights are violated from the get go. She did, you know, and, but that would have been the way it was in the Jim Crow South. She doesn't have access to attorney. She can't afford an attorney and she doesn't get a court appointed attorney until she's already indicted, you know, with murder. So she gets the in, indictment. It's only at that point that she's given a, a court appointed attorney and within, uh, and it's a week before her trial. That's the only, that's the amount of time that her attorneys have to prepare for her trial. By, but by the time the trial rolls around in, you know, Friday after Thanksgiving in, in 1932, she knows what's about. She knows she's going to be convicted. She has to know. And she had, there was a chance that she could have been hung for the crime. And so, uh, she swiftly convicted. 
But even this this jury of 12 white men, I could not give her the death sentence. Her attorney makes a valiant effort to defend her, though, doesn't he? Yeah, he he does. You know, according to witnesses, he made a valiant attempt to save her life and tried to get certain things dismissed, particularly these confessions, which were given under duress and under threat of violence. And and then he tries the, uh, you know, an insanity defense, uh, which doesn't go over. And so he does everything he can. And um, it's just it's just really clear uh, that the jury doesn't think that, the, you know, that she was fully responsible. They do believe Lawrence Williams was the trigger man uh, that shot Jenny Merrill and killed her. And now that he's dead, they convict him posthumously so that they can then put her on trial. And then she's convicted as an, a, a, an accessory. But the fact of the matter is Dick Dana and Octavia Dockery were more they were more accessories to this than Emily Burns. You know, they were much more guilty of being accessories, but they got to go home because, and essentially it's because of their race and because of their links to this Southern aristocracy, even though they're no longer part of that group. Emily Burns is kind of a scapegoat here. I mean, if Lawrence Williams hadn't been shot and killed by the police, and he was shot six times, by the way. Do you think that, that if Williams hadn't been shot, but, but captured and tried for the murder, they might not have been so hard on her? The, the feeling I got after reading your book is, is that the police really needed to put someone in jail. And as Dockery and Dana had created such sympathy, and with Williams dead, it became about Emily Burns instead. That That, by the way, I think that, his being shot and killed and being shot six times is, is, you know, by a police deputy has definitely has contemporary resonance. But yes, I think that they wanted him, you know, really, and they couldn't have him. If he had come back and been convicted, he would have hung. He would have been given the death penalty. There's no telling how they would have handled her. Uh, she might have been able to go, go home. Uh, but they had to they had to punish someone and they weren't going to punish white people, particularly white people who they felt sorry for, even though their fingerprints, I keep saying, were found in the house. It was like by the time of the, the trial, I mean, there was no discussion of fingerprint evidence, none, none. And they couldn't get the guy who had come in, uh, who was the fingerprint expert, came over from Jackson, which is the state capital. He came over to do this and he had found all this evidence. All of a sudden he goes away and there's no more discussion of fingerprint evidence. And even though the attorney, uh, Emily's attorney, they, they try to get him to come and be a witness in her trial. They, they allegedly cannot find him to come and be, be there and testify on her behalf. And so it's, it's just a, you know, such an injustice to her you know, in so many ways, so many ways. As this is happening to Emily Burns, um, as you've already mentioned, Dockery and, and Dana are charging admission to their house and they're becoming celebrities and they're making a lot of money. People can pay extra to hear him play the piano. They're, they're charging 25 cents to get in, which, which is quite a steep price in the midst of the depression. But people are willing to pay it just to see them. Oh yeah. They, 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 uh, charged two, they had two different admissions. One was 25 cents just to enter the grounds and the second 25 cents to go into the house where Dick Dana would play piano and sing songs and Octavia Dockery would regale them with stories of the old South. Um, it became lucrative there, particularly in the first days after, uh, their release. But they continued to do that for the next dozen years or so, uh, taking people's money to come see the estate. But they were most curious to meet the the two of them. Uh, that's what I think they were curious about. In, in addition to, you know, just that they wanted to see the like the squalor in which they lived. But, yeah, so they 
not only allow tourists into their home and on the estate, but they themselves went on tour throughout Louisiana and Mississippi and actually appeared on stage as the wild man and goat woman of Goat Castle. And and so they they, you know, made money doing that. So they played up on their notoriety um, and uh, and people turned out to see them, you know, by the hundreds when they show up in a in a small town like Woodville, Mississippi, which is nothing. I mean, even today, it's not big, but like 200 people would show up, you know, for a concert and to hear her talk or they went over to Jackson, Mississippi in the Capitol and also gave, you know, a big show and a lot of people turned out and they you know when this was a time when uh, downtown stores would put things on display in the windows and they had things on display in one of the uh, local department stores that were from goat castle and you know it was it's just pretty amazing uh, yes that they essentially became celebrities so despite their success one of the things that still bothers octavia dockery is she feels humiliated, right? Being connected to this case, now being connected to Lawrence Williams. And and as time marches on, Sheriff Roberts still hasn't forgotten about them, and he continues to build a case against them. Can you talk about this ongoing feud between Octavia Dockery and Sheriff Book Roberts and, and how it ultimately concludes? Yeah, essentially, she, yeah, Octavia Dockery is, one, is a litigious person. She she sued Jenny Merrill. She sued people, local members of the community. I don't I don't even include that in there. But she was just anytime she and she would use the courts and this, you know, volunteer attorneys to her advantage. And she decided that she was so humiliated by the press about her that she was going to sue the sheriff for her false arrest. And in the humiliation and she would do that for herself and also for Dick Dana on his behalf. And it's just gotten, you know, the sheriff has just had it up to his chin with that. You know, he's just done with the, these two. He, he, you know, they've just completely taken advantage of the, of their, um, their celebrity and he, he's just had it. And so, she, but she sues the sheriff. And um, he's ready and he's he decides, you know, that he, he and he responds to that lawsuit by basically outing them for their uh, capitalizing on their notoriety. He says, you know, you all went out on the, you know, on tour and referred to yourself as wild man and goat woman. And you referred to Goat Castle. So you're the one who created, you know, the humiliation. Uh, and he also decides that he's going to rearrest them for the murder of Jenny Merrill, that they're their part in the in the crime one year later. But, you know, by that time, by a year later, there is just such exhaustion in the community. They're just tired of hearing about this story. Natchez, you know, the white community is, is just exhausted from the whole goat castle media frenzy that they, you know, it makes it very, very difficult um, to field a jury and eventually, you know, is declared a mistrial. Uh, and so that kind of marks the end of the saga um, between the sheriff and this and, and Dana and Dockery. And they end up going home. But the at the end of the day, they still have those charges against them. They never do shake loose those charges. Um, it was a mistrial. And the judge says, well, you know, we could come back and do this another time, but it just never happens. So um, if nothing else, their names are, are going to be associated with this murder regardless. But they have they're, they're It's largely their own fault that, that that's how they um, are known within the community. So very rarely is there a happy ending on this podcast. <laughs> Uh, for stories that I cover. But Emily Burns, she, she'd been convicted, sentenced to life in prison, but she doesn't end up serving a life sentence, does she? No, she spends eight years in the 
Mississippi State Penitentiary. And in December 1940, the governor had gone to the prison, which is in the Delta. It's very isolated. It was a uh, basically operated like a plant, an old plantation. It was 16,000 acres in size. And, uh, you know, anybody who's ever watched Cool Hand Luke can get an idea what that was like. You know, it's just completely isolated. And so Mississippi governors during the 30s had started having what they called mercy courts. And that would be where, you know, the a person who'd been convicted could request mercy for their, you know, for their crimes. And, and, um, and there would be letters from the community and petitions from the community that, that would vouch for that person's character. And so Emily had tried before to go before these mercy courts, you know, with previous governors, but it was, but in 1940, this governor, Paul Johnson listened and believed in her innocence and he suspended her sentence. Um, and so she was able to leave prison and she returned to Natchez and she actually returned to the home she had shared with her mother when she was originally arrested. By then, though, she had learned a skill at the prison, which was sewing. And she became a seamstress in the town of Natchez and she returned to her home church, which is Antioch Baptist Church. She was able to remarry. She had been a widow early in her life and, you know, she was already a widow at 37 when she was sent to prison. So when she was in her mid fifties, she remarried to a man from her church and toward the end of her life became what we, what is called a mother of the church, which meant she had a position of respectability there in the church. Uh, and so she was able to live her life going to her church, uh, spending time with family, extended family in Natchez, and do the best she could to put that this um, part of her life behind her. And Glenwood, the goat castle, was eventually raised, right? What does the area look like now? Is there a house sitting on it? Yeah, there's a house sitting on it. Um, when I was in Natchez um, in November, we had a book launch there, and we did a tour of the neighborhood that they call Glenwood. Uh, the estate was known as Glenwood uh, officially, not Goat Castle. That was its nickname. But we went, uh, the the tour goes through the neighborhood of Glenwood, which is like basically mid-century ranch homes. And there's a house at at the crest of a of a hill of that estate, the former estate, where they believe that the that the home sat. And, uh, and so that's, that's about it. Now they've named this, the main street that goes through the community is Dana Drive, named for Dick Dana. Is there anything there now that, that existed in the 1930s when the story happened? Well, there's a lot of like vegetation, uh, around that area that, you know, that doesn't look like it's been kept up. So it kind of gives you that feel. But there was, there's actually a nursing home that was built in between the two estates. So that was probably likely where the ravine was. Uh, it may go behind there. I'm not really sure. Um, Merrill's home, uh, where the murder actually took place. So in Natchez, it's interesting because they refer to this crime as the Goat Castle murder, but it's a misnomer because the murder didn't take place at Goat Castle. It took place at at Glen Burnie, which was Merrill's home. Um, but that home has been completely restored and uh, is privately owned and uh, is sometimes open for uh, tours on the tour of homes in Natchez. Well, that's great. Always glad to hear it when history survives in a physical form. Yeah. So for listeners who want to get more information about the story and perhaps buy your book, what do you suggest? Well, I have links on my website, KarenLCoxAuthor.com, but any of the online retail outlets or um, request it from an independent bookseller. Well, we've come to the end. Thank you so much for your time. You've written a great book. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. This again has been Karen L. Cox, author of Goat Castle, A True Story of Murder, Race, and the Gothic South. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, 
broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.